So let's analyze this piece together uh, and then we'll go through an example language analysis article and language analysis um, essay that I wrote about this piece. So when you get a language analysis task, the first thing you should do is read the background information because it's nearly always significant. So let's read this one together. Lawton is a town of 3,000 people. It used to be on a major highway. However, a recent highway diversion has isolated the town, causing a sharp drop in the number of visitors, in the number of tourists who are visiting this rural town. This has caused concern for the economic future of the town. So this is um, what we're discussing. Um, this is a there. Uh, this is a range of ideas. There is a sorry, I can't read. Um, there is a range of ideas within the community about how to address this problem. Um, so this. Uh, so in your introduction in language analysis, the two main things that you're meant to include are the issue and the contentions. So this background information gives you a lot of very useful clues about what the issue is that we're addressing um, in this task. And then the contentions are what the authors say about the issue. So the issue is that this highway diversion has occurred and it isolated the town. Um, and the number of visitors visiting the town has decreased. Um, so people are very concerned about the economic future of the town and different people are now proposing different solutions to the problem. So the first piece is by the mayor, Alexandra Wiley, Councillor Alexandra Wiley. The local newspaper of Lawton publishes a weekly column written by the mayor. Uh, so the mayor is proposing a her idea of a giant attraction in this piece so we'll read it together and see how she positions uh, her readers to agree with her stance so from the outset of the piece she establishes her, her authority so she establishes that she is the mayor um, and that she has a title of um, councillor so establishes her authority and why does she want to establish her authority from the outset of the piece uh, what effect does this have on the readers you can say that it makes the readers trust her more because she um, elucidates that she's very competent and that she um, has a position of authority um, for a reason obviously and uh, it makes the readers more likely to trust her and more likely to trust her stance as a consequence um, you can say that they um, realize that um, it's her job and her duty to um, fix problems like these, um, fix economic problems in, uh, in the town. And so she is likely to come up with the best solution because it's her job to literally think, sit and think about um, these problems and these solutions. Um, and she's also representing the, the whole council um, in her piece. So she is, um, uh, she's representing a group of people who are very educated and who um, really care about the town and who are trying their best to come up with the best solution possible to this problem. Um, so yeah, wh whatever reason you can think of for um, her establishing her authority from the outset of the piece, you can include in your writing. Um, she starts her, um, her weekly column um, as a, almost a letter. So fellow residents, commencing with fellow residents, um, so this is very familiar, very um, a very direct address to um, to the uh, the people who live in her um, in her town. Um, very kind, very gentle, um, showing that she is um, part of the community and she's a very very caring person and a very friendly person, etc. Um, so this uh, this increases the sense of um, trust that uh, the readers place in her but also increases um, the affinity between her and the readers and um, creates a very um, uh, I don't know, a descriptive word for the relationship between her and the readers creates a very I can't think of anything at the moment so a very good relationship between her and the readers um, since the highway was diverted to bypass our town we have all enjoyed the resultant piece so you can see that she starts with positioning the readers to think about the issue that she wants to address. So she uh, goes chronologically through the series of events that happen. So first, the highway was diverted. So since the highway was diverted to bypass our town, we have all enjoyed the resultant piece. And then they all enjoyed the piece that followed. So obviously they had a lot of problems with the highway and maybe they even 
uh, advocated for it to be diverted and they got their way or whatever happened before this was written. How often have we thought of how pleasant it is to be able to cross the street for a chat with a friend without taking our lives in our hands? How many of us have been glad to leave our windows open without fear of dust from the road invading our rooms? So she positions the readers to... And to think about all, um, you know, all the good things, all the positives that have come out of the diversion of the highway. So she um, introduces the issue through the positives that have resulted from the diversion of the highway. And she has very long sentences that, um, that discuss this. And so the first sentence is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 words. The second sentence, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. The second sentence is 29 words. And the third sentence is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And the third sentence is 22 words. So she has very long sentences that um, very nicely and gently talk about how awesome it has been to have this resultant piece um, out of the highway um, and she positions her readers to be comfortable um, in in reflecting on this with her and to uh, and to acknowledge that the diversion of the highway was a good thing um, and she also has a lot of inclusive language in in these first few sentences and a, a lot of uh, very uh, very friendly words like friend, chat, pleasant, glad, leave windows, the image of leaving your window open um, without dust invading your room. Uh, so she's um, uh, expounding upon all the very awesome positives that have resulted from this diversion of the highway. But all of this positivity and wonderfulness and exalt this exultant tone is brought to a massive halt with this sh short super 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 abrupt sentence that's diametrically opposed to the long sentences that precede it so you have uh, this sentence coming up but there is a downside to this so abruptly she stops she changes the rhythm of her piece and she says that um, unfortunately the, all of this goodness that we've enjoyed has a downside uh, so she uh, takes her readers on a journey with her to to feel like there is an important issue that's um, that's affecting the town, and through the abruptness of the rhythm, she makes them worry about this issue, and um, thus feel like a solution is necessary. And so she's taking them on a journey and positioning them to be ready to agree with her. We risk becoming a backwater on the way to becoming a ghost town. We. Um, risk is, is, is so we inclusive language again um, she is um, elucidating that she is definitely a part of the issue herself and she's uh, really encouraging the readers to trust her and to trust that because she is a part of the issue herself and she is also facing the problem like all of the residents of Wharton uh, she is likely to want to find the best solution for herself and so and so the best solution for the town we risk becoming a backwater on the way to becoming a ghost town so very um, uh, loaded words, very emotional, emotionally charged words. If this piece is all we have. So there's a consequence to the awesome piece that they've enjoyed. Of course, we no longer want huge trucks thundering down the main street, but we do want cars, cars full of people who will eat at our beautiful bakery, socialize at our historic pub, pub buy our handcrafts and used books, even stay at our comfortable motel. We want tourists. And to be blunt, we need their money. So this is a very, um, uh, so she makes herself seem very honest in this sentence. This is a very honest sentence. Um, and she's saying that um, the town is facing um, economic consequences because people are no longer coming to the town. And the town is at risk, a very strong word, is at risk of becoming a ghost town if nothing is done. So through this, all of this positioning that happened in this first paragraph, she puts the readers in a... Um, uh, in a place that they feel like a, an immediate solution is required and so they are li very likely to agree with the solution that she proposes 
in the second paragraph. So she um, prepares the readers to agree with her. Oh, um, one of my students uses the word primes, which is nice. So she primes the readers to agree with the solution that she proposes in the second paragraph. Council has been considering for some time how to attract travellers and we think we have the answer. So again, she's still positioning the readers. She hasn't proposed her solution yet. She continues to, um, uh, to um, shepherd the readers slowly, slowly, to, and then she introduces her solution. So council has been considering for some time. So for some time indicates that there was a lot of deliberation and that, and she uses the word council to highlight that they're, an, or that they're authoritative figures, they are very, very trustworthy, that, um, that the reader should place their trust in them, that, that they are um, in positions of power, etc. Um, so through, uh, through referring to counsel and referring um, in this appeal to authority, she uh, g gives weight to the solution that she ultimately proposes and thus uh, encourages the readers to, uh, to trust the ultimate solution that she proposes. Council has been considering for some time how to attract travellers and we think we have the answer. Um, the fact that she said for some time indicates that they've been that they've allocated a lot of time and a lot of resources and a lot of thought to the solution so again it, um, it uh, gives some weight to the solution some gravity to the solution and uh, encourages the readers to accept the solution when it's ultimately brought up how to attract travelers and we think we have the answer we have stopped thinking small and have started thinking on a grand scale so this is a pun that both um, talks about how the um, ultimate statue itself will be grand and how they're thinking on a, uh, on a grand scale. Um, our region is famous for the quality and freshness of its luscious produce, very descriptive, but we need a showcase for it. We grow the most crisp, most succulent fruit and vegetables around and they should be our emblem imagine a spectacular piece of modern architecture so only then does she actually propose her solution so almost halfway into the piece so the first half of the piece the entire commencement outside of the piece is just priming the readers to accept the solution she knows that her readers are um, likely to be perhaps surprised by the solution and so she um, takes a very very long time to prepare them to feel like this solution is necessary uh, and uh, and thus position them in a, in, in a place that they, they that they are likely to agree with her so firstly she um, makes them feel like an immediate urgent solution is necessary uh, to save their town and then she makes them feel like the most important part of their town is the produce and how amazing the town's produce is and thus their emblem should be this produce. So now she makes them feel like, so altogether she makes them feel like an immediate solution is required, a large solution is required, and that has to be, um, it has to be something to do with fruit and vegetables. And then she introduces her idea. Imagine a spectacular piece of modern architecture, a landmark, a building in which visitors can enjoy our hospitality and in front, in front of which they can take selfies to show their friends. We would have it created right here by our local craftsmen and women. There could be no better place for it than in our verdant centennial park, soaring to a height of 20 meters or more. It would tower over the trees and even over the spire of St. Martin's Church. Imagine the events we could hold and all the merchandise that would go with it. Cuddly toys, cards and gifts in the tourist center. The list goes on and on, all to promote our region. She encourages the readers to go on a journey of imagining the solution with her and she uh, details all the positive things that would happen because of it. Um, the craftsmen and women would get jobs, um, we, they would have events, they would have um, merchandise that would go with it and there would be so many benefits to, uh, to this amazing idea. Um, she uses um, a, a, an ellipsis to highlight that uh, the list goes on and on and on and on and that there is no end to the positive consequences of, um, of this solution. We don't yet have the final concept for what the structure will look like, 
but already, of course, we hear the naysayers. So she preemptively, preemptively rebuts uh, people who might be against the solution, um, and she calls them naysayers. So they're negative people who uh, their entire job is to just say no and to ruin every positive idea and they don't have any positive thing to say themselves, they don't have any solutions to propose themselves, they just ruin everything for everybody and they are just pessimistic people who are horrible to be around. Um, so again, um, a very, very emotionally charged colloquial word that immediately discredits her opponents before she's even discredited, discredited their ideas. Um, it isn't original. It has it has been done. A giant attraction. Can't we think of something else? Um, and through the um, the short sentences that um, that she sort of quotes from their perspective, um, because they're in quotation marks, that means that the naysayers are saying it. And um, because the because the sentences are short, so they're very um, a lot of the words are monosyllabic. She's trying to illustrate that um, that these people are very dumb, that they haven't really thought deeply about the issue, and that. Um, they're just saying no for the sake of it. They ha don't have any deep thoughts themselves. Um, so yeah, so this is very, very strong discrediting of anyone who would be against her idea. And through this very strong discrediting of anyone who'd be against her idea, she entices the readers to want to be on her side so that, uh, that they are on the smart, caring side rather than the negative, pessimistic, naysayer side. Um, but do you know what? All the towns with giant attractions are thriving. Visitors love them. Very excited quotation marks um, to make the readers excited about her idea as well. Research shows uh, make, make the reader um, enthusiastic about her idea. Research shows that towns with giant attractions receive 20% more visitors. So statistics um, to... Um, uh, highlight that this is a very logical argument and that this um, that she has research to back up um, back up her stance um, again gives authority to her stance and makes the readers more likely to adopt her stance we have been told there are people who make a point of seeing everyone of photographing them all even making a competition of it we deserve a share of that prosperity prosperity is a very beautiful word very descriptive word um, and it's exactly what the town needs in order to not become a ghost town. Fellow residents. So she, again, repeats fellow residents, which she commenced her piece with. And it sort of has a bookending um, effect to her article. So she commences with fellow residents when she introduces the problem. And then she ends with fellow residents after she's finished introducing the solution. So she makes us feel like this is a worthy solution and an equal solution to this problem. And is the only thing that will uh, that will combat this big problem that we have, fellow residents. This is our chance. Again, um, her piece is replete with um, with inclusive language to make the readers feel like she's absolutely on their side. She's facing the same issues that they are facing. She's affected by this um, economic problem, and she wants to make sure that the town found, finds a good solution for it. We have to protect our lifestyle our rural, wholesome Australian lifestyle in our un own unpolluted town with its healthy food, sporting teams and annual show. This is a very powerful um, appeal to rural Australian values and um, is likely to be a very, very strong, very strong uh, appeal to her uh, readers values. And she um, does this in order to make sure that they um, emotionally uh, that they are emotionally gripped to agree with her and to feel like this solution is a good solution that rescues their Australian life, their Australian values. We must preserve our caring community where neighbours know and look out for one another. We want to welcome newcomers and offer them a chance to prosper amongst us. We want our farmers to have buyers for their produce, our young people to have jobs. our hospital and nursing home to be viable. So she talks about all the people who might, might be vulnerable in their society and she talks about how um, she appeals to the, uh, people's desire to help pe people who are more vulnerable um, from young people to farmers to hospital and nursing homes. And so people, these pe the, the, her readers want to perceive themselves as good people and so they will want to agree with her argument in order to feel like they're helping the vulnerable and they're helping people who are less advantaged than they are. 
we need to be on the tourist map and your council feels like this is feels this is the way to, to achieve it um so in, uh, sorry so back to this um so uh, her readers are likely to want to perceive themselves as good people who are helping the less vulnerable rather than just doing it for economic reasons so she um uh, so she appeals to to that value to uh, again ensure that they would agree with her stance and that they would adopt her stance and advocate for it we need to be on the tourist map and your council feels this is the way to achieve it. Uh, her last sentence here is very, very important. Please support this exciting idea for making Lawton a truly great town. So she puts an onus or a responsibility on the readers to, um, to advocate for her idea. So not only does she position the readers to want to agree with her idea and to want this to happen, but she also places an onus on them to advocate for her idea uh, to, you know, perhaps their friends or other politicians in the, in the district or other, or other people. Um, and because of all the positioning that she's done and all the arguments that she's put before she um, introduces this onus that she puts on the readers, the readers are likely to agree with her and are likely to become advocates for her idea. In the next edition, the local newspaper published the following letter. So this is a letter of reply to Wiley's article. Of course we share Councillor Wiley's concern. Of course we want our town to survive. But destroying its beauty is not the way to make it great. Our country is paved. The country is paved with plenty of giant attractions. All large, ugly installations. Can't we be different? Can't we have a cultural focus? Surely an art gallery, an annual music festival, a literary week would be preferable to a monstrosity. Um, so, uh, immediately, Warwick's letter is very, very different from uh, Alexander, Wiley's, oh, Alexander Wiley's letter. So, um, his letter is a lot more strident in tone, a lot more aggressive, um, a lot more denigrating and uh, has sort of a tone of superiority um, uh, to, to hers. Hers is a lot more gentle, um, a lot more uh, enthusiastic, a lot more happy um, than, than his one is. So immediately we can detect this um, difference in tone. Um, he also has his credentials in the piece in the same way that she does. And uh, in, in the same way that her credentials establish her authority and increase the, the trust that the readers are likely to place on in her, um, his is likely to do the same thing. Um, the illustrator doesn't really do the same thing. He, he doesn't give us his credentials, so we don't know if he's part of a volunteer association. We don't know if he's even part of the town. Um, he doesn't do the same thing to establish his authority that they do. Um... He has a, uh, a lot of very sharp, sharp, short sentences in contrast to her very long sentences. Um, and these contribute to, uh, to his strident, aggressive, uh, vociferous tone. Um, uh, at the outset of his piece, he also establishes his concern about the ec economics of the town. But he says that um, he, uh, that he wants his town to be different. He, he doesn't want his town to be a monstrosity to have a monstrosity like every other town. He he wants uh, his town to be more more cultured and refined and superior. Um, can't we be different? Can't we have a cultural focus? You can say these are rhetorical questions um, to um, say that uh, because he already denigrated her idea. Um, by saying these are ugly large installations, um, the country is paved with them, etc. So um, he's already denigrated them. So the readers are likely to feel like, yes, we, you know, we do need to be different. He provided the answer already. Um, having a cultural focus is maybe a good idea because these are really, um, these are really bad ideas that the councillor came up with. Surely an art gallery, an annual music festival, a literary week would be preferable to a monstrosity. The world already has many, too many selfie opportunities. So he also uses exclamation marks in the same way that, uh, sorry, in a very different way to the mayor. So the mayor uses her exclamation marks um, to show how um, how amazing and exciting this idea is. But he uses his exclamation marks to um, denigrate 
um, dumb people who want to take selfies and um, and unrefined people who uh, who he doesn't want to, to come to his town his town surely visitors who like this sort of thing are not the type we want before we know it the showcase will be overrun by loud children and defaced by vandals um, again he also uses very emotionally charged words defaced um, overrun vandals um, polluted but um, where did he say how much of words were? Let's talk about na naysayers. So, um, uh, she uses uh, the word naysayers, which is very, uh, um, very emotionally charged, um, uh, to denigrate uh, her opposition, and he uses it to denigrate the um, pe the people who will come and who will um, vandalize their uh their structure so you can say that they use it in the same way to denigrate people who, who um and to denigrate a group of people um and thus make the readers not want to be part of this group of people slash not want to endorse this group of people and thus um agree with their stance slash with their point of view let us consider what gives value to our lives um so he is again appealing to quality of life Um, in the same way that she does so she says in order to save our quality of life and save our resultant peace we need to do this necessary evil we need to erect this this giant structure but he says that uh, so he also appeals to quality of life but his his appeal is to say that we don't need this giant structure this giant structure will um will destroy our quality of life not just the economic threat um i'll try to re rephrase that in a second to um, to make it more clear and let us consider what gives value to our lives it is not prosperity at any price it is not sporting teams and the noisy show it is quality of ideas it is the pursuit of beauty so he says that what we do for this economic prosperity is as important as the economic prosperity itself um, and it will affect our quality of life as much as becoming a ghost town will so it's very 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 important that we're very selective about what we do and not just do anything and pursue prosperity at any price um so he goes in his thinking he goes one step further than the mayor does so the mayor just goes to think about uh economic prosperity but he goes to think about economic prosperity and how to achieve this economic prosperity so he his thinking is on um, two levels, whereas he, her thinking, um, he makes her thinking seem like it's just on one level. And so in contrast to her, he makes himself seem um, uh, a lot more intellectual slash intellectually superior. And um, through this um, seeming intellectual superior superiority, he wants to entice the readers to agree with his stance more than they agree with hers. Um, and yeah, so again, he, um, his appeal to quality of life is saying that there are uh, the economics, the becoming a ghost town will uh, affect our quality of life, but prosperity at any price will also destroy our quality of life. And it's very, very important that we think about what we're doing um, uh, before just um, uh, uh, implementing any solution just because it solves this problem. Um, yeah, so both writers appeal appeal to um, the, uh, the residents' desire to have a good quality of life, um, to, uh, to entice the readers to agree with their diametrically opposed points of view. Um, diametrically opposed... means um, exactly opposed, like positive and negative are opposed to each other. Our young people, so he also appeals to our desire to help young people and to help the vulnerable, but he, he uses it to um, make sure that the readers agree with him as opposed to Wiley. Our young people will be better employed as catalogue designers, gallery guides, or storytellers. So he talks about 
um, jobs that are more refined, that are more um, cultured, and he um, he does this to make sure that readers who perceive themselves as intellectual or who who, perceive, who want to perceive themselves as intellectual or cultured are um, uh, really really want to agree with him and to um, and to support his point of view. We say to counsel, please think again. In a very similar way to Wiley, he also uh, concludes his piece with a short, sharp sentence. Um, uh, to encourage the council to go back to the drawing board and to think about the issue again. The cartoonist, this it actually took me a very long time to decide on the contention of the cartoonist. Uh, so as we said before, one second. Um, as we said before, um, it's very important to determine the issue. So we've determined that here and the contentions of all pieces. So um, the first piece clearly is saying that the solution is um, this giant attraction. The second piece is clearly saying that a more cultural um, focus and a more refined solution is the way forward. But this, um, it took me a very long time to determine whether he was... Um, for the giant attraction or against the giant attraction or it's still equivocal in the middle not really decided showing the positives and the negatives of the giant attraction but i think i've decided that he's um, denigrating subtly denigrating the giant attraction and i'll try to explain why um so he depicts uh lawton after this giant attraction has been built and he depicts exactly what the what the mayor proposes and what the mayor says the benefits will be so uh this giant attraction has been built in the verdant um in the verdant centennial park soaring to a height of 20 meters above St. Martin's Church and above all the trees and you can see that all that's been uh, that has all been achieved um, all, there are so many cars that have come to the town uh, and uh, so many people that have come to the town and this business is clearly thriving so it's clearly had a good economic um, uh, result for the town but um, it's quite a garish ugly sort of structure that's made the town seem very it seemed quite ugly and besides the tourists the rest of the town seems dead people don't really um there isn't much life uh there aren't any happy people that i can see except these kids that are excitedly um l looking at the town again maybe referring to these loud children and so he's saying that even though the town has achieved prosperity and has avoided becoming a ghost town it, this has definitely been prosperity at any price it hasn't really been worth it and um what finally convinced me information is three thousand people and the councillor says that um we we want to welcome newcomers and offer them a chance to prosper amongst us among us and so out of this whole huge garish structure and out of this um you know this huge idea that's been implemented and blah blah only one person has come to the town and has joined their community so uh it's definitely been um prosperity at any price and prosperity that's not really worth it he the gary shaw does show that this giant structure will save the town but he subtly um, intimates to the writers, to the readers, that there are better solutions that should be considered, not just this prosperity at any price idea. So that's what I think of what he's saying. You can definitely disagree as long as you can justify it with, um, uh, with evidence from the image. So now I wanted to together read this essay that I wrote about the, the piece and to um, and to go through the ideas together. So this essay took me about 1.5 hours um, and it's 1,500 words. So uh, as, as I said before and as I will probably repeat a billion times to your annoyance, um, you need to uh, determine what the issue is and what the contentions are. Um, so the key question or the issue is um, 
is how can we avoid becoming a ghost town? Um, and uh, the contentions to Alexandra Wiley um, contends um, is that we should build a large monument in our town. Um, Ian Warwick says that we need a cultural focus and not just survival at any price. Um, and Gary Shaw, uh, he says that we, Gary Shaw does not offer any alternative solutions. He just says that we don't need survival at any price. Um, uh, slash we need to reconsider the repercussions of our actions and not just accept survival at any price. Um, so another one of my students, uh, actually I think it's the same student, really likes the word impetus. So what gave impetus to the writing of, um, of these three pieces? And the issue that gave impetus to the writing of these three pieces is the um, concern about the economic future of the town. Impetus means sort of like the energy or the push to, to write the three pieces. So this is the introduction. In an introduction, so um, this is a much, much, much longer introduction than I usually write. Uh, in an introduction, all you need, um, uh, from what I've been taught, um, is the issue and the contentions of all three pieces. Um, if you want to also put in the um, audience or tone or anything like that, that's completely up to you and your teacher. But by, 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 VC, by VCAA standards, all you need is the issue and the contentions of all three pieces. So... And starting with the issue first, the diversion of the highway to bypass Lawton has blessed the inhabitants with immense resultant peace and has significantly improved their quality of life. However, it has also come with some pecuniary consequences, some financial consequences. In diverting the highway, the town has jeopardized their status as a tourist host and thus visited support for their local businesses and industries including their local bakery, historic pub, handcrafts, and used books. Councillor Alexandra Wiley published a column in the local paper representing the local council, proposing that building a spectacular piece of modern architecture soaring to a height of 20 metres or more is the solution to this issue. So the first sentence talks about the issue, and the second sentence um, uh, here talks about the uh, contention of Alexandra Wiley. If you want, you can put mayor in here so that you're not repeating council, council. Ian Warwick, the president of the Lawton Progress Association, expressed his disgust and disparagement of her idea through his letter, calling the locals to shun prosperity at any price and advocating for a refined cultural focus. Um, so this is talking about his contention. So second contention. Gary Shaw, the illustrator, more subtly than both of them, critiques the prosperity at any price approach. Oh, sorry, more subtly than Warwick. Warwick very directly critiques the prosperity at any price approach. His cartoon portrays the garishness and monstrosity of the giant watermelon, but also demonstrates that it will succeed in achieving the economic goals that the council has set for us. Um, so, as I said in, my pre in the previous videos, uh, all you need in the introduction is contentions, three contentions, or contentions of all pieces make sure you don't miss any pieces um, and the issue uh, make sure you don't miss any pieces a lot of students miss the um, contention of the illustrator uh, so make sure you don't do that um, and if you and if you don't ha haven't decided about the contention uh, maybe you can just leave space and then come back to it um, at the end or just have one one page for, just for the introduction and just leave that space and then if you don't use it just cross that space out in the exam um, or whatever approach you like just make sure you do not miss out on any contentions um and in one of the previous videos i went through the the different ways to structure comparative essays make sure you have a look at that video but the way that I'm doing now, um, and generally my preferred way when I was in uh, when I was doing comparative essays, is to analyze the first piece as though it existed completely by itself, and as though uh, I was doing a single analysis. So analyze the first piece completely, then analyze the second piece, always contra contrasting it to the first piece, and then analyze the third piece, always contrasting it with the first and second piece. That was the method that I was most comfortable with and it worked very well for me. Um, it required the least uh, preparation time, wasted the least preparation time 
and I just really like that method. So make sure you find uh, the method that you're most comfortable with, try all of them, see which one works best for you, and just stick with that. Um, and yeah, you can get a 10 out of 10 using all three methods, um, as long as your writing is good and you're not repeating yourself too much. So, Wiley's personal informal letter. So I like interest interspersing tone words throughout the analysis rather than formally acknowledging that this is the tone. Um, I find that this is more nuanced and is nicer. Um, in our language analysis study guide, you can probably find nicer words, but in my 1.5 hours, I couldn't think of anything, so I just wrote whatever first came to mind. Wiley's personal informal letter seeks to position the readers to feel like to feel that a giant attraction is the only solution to their town's economic predicament. Um, so starting with the contention is. A good topic sentence because obviously the entire piece will address the contention. She commences. So, um, commence and commencement and outset are two of my favorite words, favorite alternative words for beginning. Um, so instead of saying at the beginning of her piece, you would say at the commencement of her piece or from the outset of her piece. I really, really like those words. You'll probably notice me using them a lot and I'd encourage you to use them as well. So she commences her piece with a warm, so again, tone, with a warm address to her fellow residents, positioning herself as deeply invested in the issue and personally affected by it. This, so as we discussed, um, she uses fellow residents to make sure that the residents feel like she's um, personally affected by the issue and that she is personally invested in it. This instantaneously create, creates an affiliation with her readers. I really like the words affiliation and affinity in talking about the relationship between the reader and the writer. Encouraging them to trust her from the outset. So, outset and commences, really good words. Such positioning of the readers ensure that, ensures that she maximizes the chance that they will agree with her stance when she calls them to action later in the piece. So, um, all of her positioning is absolutely deliberate and she wants to make sure that the readers will agree with her and will um, respond to her onus slash her call to action that occurs at the end of the piece. This sense of affinity with the readers is bolstered by the inclusive language sporadically interspersed th throughout her piece. Our town, we have all, and the colloquial conversational familiar style of writing without taking our lives in our hands. The first few sentences of Wiley's piece expound upon the current situation of the town. They discuss how the highway has been built and how the resultant piece that ensued and other benefits which the residents have derived. The sentences she employs to illustrate these peaceful images are elaborately long, averaging around 23 words in length. So if we average these 16, 29, and 22, we get around 23 words. This peaceful mellifluous, however you pronounce that word, pace is abruptly brought to a sudden halt when she introduces the issue she seeks to discuss, affirming to the readers the magnitude of the issue. So as we discussed, this abrupt halt um, comes when she starts discussing the problem. The sentence which introdu introduces the issue is seven words in length, a stark contrast to the preceding sentences. The abrupt halt in rhythm and shift to a concerned, alarmed manner, both, so both the, uh, the change in rhythm and the tone that she now adopts. Um, so please have a look at the tone video about how manner, style, I just read the word style, totally lost it. Um, how manner and style are alternatives to uh, to tone, and how uh, and how uh, uh, how to talk about tone without using the word tone itself. So watch the tone video; it will make sense. Um, the abrupt halt in rhythm and shift to a concerned, alarmed manner both stress to the reader the magnitude and urgency of the issue, further ensuring that they will be positioned to feel that an immediate solution is imperative. The finality of the problem is further echoed in the second short sentence, sentence which follows shortly. We want tourists and to be blunt, we need their money. The raw honesty Wiley displays, displays coaxes the readers to place their trust in her 
um, to place their trust in her. As lo the local councils and politicians are frequently lampooned, lampooned across Australia, Australian culture, Wiley, Wiley's choice to position herself as a fellow citizen rather than as, an, as, a, as a sort of an intellectual authority figure ensures that she maximises the likelihood that members of her jurisdiction will agree with her. So she deliberately um, positions herself as a friend as, and as a fellow resident rather than as a deliberate authority, although she subtly refers to her, her authority. Um, her choice to, to position herself like this makes sure, make, ensures that most people will be open to agreeing with her. She is very familiar with Australian culture and endeavours to ensure through the way she positions herself that she has the maximum chance of encouraging her readers to assume her stance and support her radical proposal. Only after this very deliberate and careful positioning of her readers, so we said that she spends nearly half her piece just positioning her readers, she hasn't introduced her idea yet. Only after this very careful and, uh, and deliberate positioning of her readers does Wiley finally introduce her answer. So um, only in the second, um, second part of the piece does she finally introduce her answer in the second half of her piece. Wiley takes her readers on a journey, probably can be f better phrased, uh, Wiley encourages her, invites her readers on a journey of imagining all the benefits of the new showcase. Her sentences become longer, more descriptive, and more exultant as she encourages readers to optimistically journey with her to the future. Imagine a spectacular piece of modern architecture, a landmark, blah, blah, blah. She enumerates the positive repercussions of the landmark, created right here by our local craftsmen and women. Imagine the events we could hold and the merchandise. She complements her exult exultant tone with the very pragmatic benefits, um, the merchandise, the money, etc., the industries, which appeal to a very wide range of people in society. So both the people who are excited about the solution um, and the people who are worried about money. From artisans to people who enjoy public events to shopkeepers to young people. Through this approach, Wiley aims to enlist the support of as wide an audience base as possible for her idea. She preemptively rebuts the notion that this isn't original and reiterates that her idea will bring prosperity to the, to the entire community. Um, sorry, this analysis is a bit too fast, but I think I was running out of time. Um, uh, but yeah, she enumerates um, all the benefits to the different types of people, tries to enlist the support of as many people as possible, and then I tried to, to talk about this rebuttal that happens here um, to say that um, she, you know, denigrates the naysayers and um, um, and says that her idea will bring prosperity to the entire community. Wiley's final paragraph. Um, so I do this a lot in my analyses when I run out of time because I've spent too much time analyzing something else and then I analyze something else really, really quickly. Um, if you can avoid doing this, it would be ideal, but if you're like me, it's fine. I got away with it. Wiley's final paragraph is a very powerful call to action, play, placing a very heavy onus, onus again means responsibility, on the readers to side with her and endorse her idea. Intimately repeating fellow residents, she positions the readers to feel threatened and unsafe through the very powerful, powerfully emotive word protect. She positions the readers to feel like, to feel that they will lose all that they hold sacred, their rural, wholesome Australian lifestyle, their unpolluted town, their healthy food, sporting teams, an annual show, and caring community, if they do not advocate for her idea. So she says that all of this is at threat if they do not advocate for her idea. Her enumeration of such essential core values to the Australian community are likely to fill her readers with passion for her cause and is. Um, her enumeration of such essential core values to the Australian community is likely to fill her readers with passion for her cause and is likely to make them not only adopt her stance but to become fierce advocates for her idea. So um, uh, this talking about Australian values etc positions the readers to when she talks about this onus um, positions the readers to uh, make sure that they do not only um, become uh, uh, sorry they do not only agree with her idea but they also become fierce advocates for her idea to other people this is Wiley's core aim as she is likely to face some political opposition and will require as much support as possible from residents so as you saw this initial analysis is all analyzing piece one as though it existed completely by itself 
um, and then we start analyzing piece two, contrasting it to piece one. Ian Warwick's letter responding to Wiley's piece is similarly personal and informal in style. So um, in comparatives, I've been told that you need at least three to five comparisons in order to get at least a 50%. If you do not have, if you have zero comparisons, then um, you can't get above 50% because it's a comparative essay. So make sure you have at least um, three to five comparisons in order to get above 50%. So um, someone just texted me and it stopped recording. So uh, let's start again with piece two. So um, last thing I was saying was three to five comparisons are required in order to get above 50% because this is a comparative task. Um, so Ian Warwick's letter responding to Wiley's piece is similarly personal and informal in style. That's the first comparison that we've done. So the, comparing their styles of writing, but calls for a cultural solution and disparages the council's proposal of a large landmark. The second comparison is the comparison of their contentions, um, which is done in the second part of the first sentence. Commencing in the same way that Wiley does, Warwick's first few sentences are replete with inclusive language. So this is our third comparison, comparing the uh, techniques that they use, uh, the persuasive techniques. We watch our towns to survive, we share, etc. Again, similar to Wiley, he positions himself as a local who deeply cares about the economic fate of the town. However, in stark contrast to Wiley, he also depicts himself as culturally and intellectually superior to the council. So Wiley depicts himself herself as part of the council um, and... Um, as uh, he's on the same level as them um, and agreeing with them, but he depicts himself as superior. He denigrates the idea of large, ugly installations and labels them a monstrosity, instead calling for a more refined focus on an art gallery, an annual music festival, or, or, or a literary week. He then invites the readers to consider the type of tourists they want to attract and to consider that the selfie tourists, the loud children, and the vandals are not the answer. Warwick positions the readers to consider the consequences of the decision they make about the caliber of attraction they choose, and thus the type of people they will attract to their town. So um, he steps one level further in thinking than Wiley, and thus depicts himself as a wiser, deeper, more reliable thinker. So this is the one level, two level um, idea that we discussed earlier. In creating this contrast with Wiley, he endeavours to encourage the readers to, in, in, to trust her stance more than hers because he's a deeper, more reliable thinker. He thought about it on two levels rather than just the superficial what solution can we think of. In concluding, Warwick echoes Wiley's appeal for, to, for, uh, to caring for the vulnerable in society, so young people. Uh, young people. He, but he advocates for a more refined employment for their young people rather than just any employment. Again, positioning himself as superior to the council in thinking and in taste. Our young people would be better employed as catalog designers, gallery guides, or storytellers. Any community members who seek to perceive, perceive themselves as intellectual or cultural, cultured are likely to be affected by his arguments or are likely to be swayed by his arguments. Finally, let's talk about the illustrator. The illustrator, Gary Shaw, seeks to contribute to the debate through pictorially depicting the consequences, mostly negative, of the council's idea. So, as we mentioned, now we analyse the third piece, comparing it to the first and second. Whilst he is also condemnatory of the idea, like Warwick, so now we're comparing him to Warwick, his approach is much more subtle than, than Warwick and than the first piece. The image depicts the town after having built the giant watermelon, having avoided the fate of becoming a ghost town, with cars driving in and loud children excitedly gazing at the watermelon from afar. This is there is clearly heavy traffic generated by the monument, so many cars, and the local industries have survived, as evinced by the fresh watermelons business. Shaw illustrates that this has been at too high a price though. The watermelon has taken over the life in the town, is larger than the church, and is not in keeping with the aesthetics of the town. He pictorially depicts all the ideas that Wiley proposed, underlining how disruptive rather than exciting they are. With a very snide demeanour, Shaw has increased the population of Lawton in his image from the current 3,000 to 3,001. 3,000 to 3,001. To refer to Wiley's argument that the monument will encourage newcomers to settle in Lawton, he 
illustrates that this has occurred, but the price has been too large, both metaphorically and literally, for one person. His approach to refuting the council's ideas is through inviting the readers to pictorially see the disruptiveness of and the lack of refinement of these ideas, rather than through proposing alternatives, an approach Warwick primarily relied on. His image is likely to convince the readers that this idea of a giant watermelon is not the solution the town needs, and that the council needs to think again, echoing Warwick. So he says um, that uh, the council needs to think again in the same way that Warwick says the council needs to think again, um, but he is saying it pictorial. So now um, let's read the conclusion together. So the three pieces all explore the issue Vorton faces in risking becoming a ghost town. So again, reintroducing the um, issue. After the highway diversion, the mayor, Alexandra Wiley, enthusiastically proposes that the town embraces the culture of small towns and builds a giant monument, like other small towns have done, to attract visitors. Warwick and Shaw, Shaw both argue against this, Warwick firmly and Shaw delivering his message in a more, much more subtle manner. So talking about their style. They all seek to appeal to a rural Australian through to maybe to rural Australian values to or to a rural Australian community. Sorry, I'm not sure what I was trying to say there. Um, to rural Australian values through uh, to a rural Australian community through appeals to local values and through engendering concern about the fate of their fellow residents and uh, and through engendering concern about their fellow residents. I've always um, struggled with um, conclusions to comparatives because with conclusions to singular single pieces you can just analyze how the writer ended but it's a bit harder to do with um, with comparatives and uh, I guess much harder to do with images because there's not really um, a discrete end um, so I so I take the more summarizing approach sometimes in uh, comparative conclusions but uh, you can also do the um, analyzing how all the writers and finish their pieces if you like if that works for you um, oh, and also another way that I, I sometimes uh, rely on another method that I sometimes rely on is analyzing the tone so analyzing the tone of the three pieces in the conclusion and I find that that's a very um, beautiful way to end especially if you've been saving up a lot of nice tone words So yeah, um, this is uh, an entire comparative piece from start to end. Um, I hope it's been useful. Um, feel free to write your own essays on the 2016 exams and send them to us. Um, we will try to read them and give you feedback. Um, and make sure you have a look at the other videos and use the study guide every single time you are writing a comparative um, analysis piece because the more you use the study guide, the more likely all the vocabulary will be ingrained in your mind and the more likely you will be to remember it in the exam when it all counts. So all the best with everything. Um, please get in touch with us if you need any help and good luck. Farewell.